give you a classic example. In 1964, the then Cassius Clay was due to fight Sonny Liston. And I was 12 years old, and I was in the sixth grade. And I'd seen television interviews with both uh, Clay and Liston. And I really thought that Clay was the better fighter. I thought he was the better athlete. And I thought he would win the fight. And as you know, uh, Clay had uh, nicknames for each one of the fighters he would face. And he had little poems that he would rhyme and make fun of them and tease his opponents with. And I thought that was the most clever thing I'd ever seen in boxing. And so I wrote a little poem about him. And when I came to school and I read the poem, I became the villain of the school for taking sides with Clay. And that's when I realized that, that this, this was a man who was very catalytic, where you couldn't remain neutral. You either loved him or hated him. And I loved him. You know, that's just the initial thing for me as a 12-year-old kid. Of course, the other thing for me is being African-American, I had finally, finally found a champion. And the reason why he was such a champion to me is because he would not let white uh, a manager speak for him. Uh, prior to this time, if you saw a black athlete on television, if his white manager didn't speak for him, you didn't hear from him. And they, the, the athletes were seen, but never interviewed and never talked to as if they were real live human beings. They were, they were spoken of in hushed terms as if they were commodities. And you were expected to go to the Olympics and perhaps win a gold medal or something and then come home and have nothing to say about the, the quality of your own life. And Ali said, no, 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 give me the microphone. So that, that, that type of courage turned me into another human being. Well, and that, that's like, you know, back in that day, I don't think anyone really appreciated what he was about. Everyone thought he was a boxer and was really mouthy, but, I mean, that was his plan all along. That was how he got the attention that he needed to, to, to be able to, I don't know, preach his doctrine is the right term, or to, to and, and I guess for older guys like myself and not as young as Polly, maybe they don't realize the, the racial unrest there was in the U.S., even in the 60s. Absolutely incredible uh, forms of malcontent, uh, horrible mistreatment of people. Um, as you know, there was a thought of some time ago of when it came to voting purposes, counting an African-American as three-fifths of a vote. Now, if can you imagine the hypocrisy of that? Uh, and, 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 and yet you have a country that's talking about uh, we're the greatest nation on the face of the earth and our nation is going around the world telling every other nation about their various human rights violations. Here's a couple of things that people don't know about Muhammad Ali. Ali was glad to go to the Olympics and he was proud. He could not have been prouder to represent the United States of America. In 1960, he won the gold medal as a light heavyweight uh, boxer and he would only box three rounds in the Olympics and none of his opponents could even make it to three rounds, let alone 15 in professional boxing. They couldn't last three rounds with him. He stopped every opponent. And the ones he didn't knock out, the referee stopped because he was beating them so bad. Yeah. And then he came back to the United States. And, and then while he was over there, they interviewed and they asked him, they said, how do you feel about representing a country where there's certain times that a black man cannot stay at a certain hotel or can't eat at a certain restaurant? He said, the United States of America is still the greatest nation on the face of the earth, and we have experts working on that. He stood up for the USA. And I'll tell you what eventually wounded him almost to an unprecedented degree. When he came back from the Olympics, you know, it's from Louisville, Kentucky. Right. There was a group of 11 white businessmen who said they were going to put up the money and sponsor his career. And they were going to meet him to sign the papers at a certain restaurant. And he went to the restaurant and the maitre d' wouldn't let him into the restaurant to sign the papers. Wow. 
He said, and they said, no, I'm sorry, you can't come in. He said, there's 11 men in there sitting there waiting for me. If I don't come in there, my career doesn't take off. I'm just doing what they're telling me to do. And that's when he went out to the bridge over top of the Ohio River and took his gold medal and threw it in the river. And you, you, you couldn't be as angry as he was unless you had been let down as deeply as he was. And the one thing I got from Ali that I, that, I, that I cherish is his absolute hatred for racism. And he, he said this, he said, I do not accept it, both him and Jim Brown. He said, I do not accept second-class citizenship. If hell frees over, I will not accept second-class citizenship. I just went and represented this nation, and I beat every foe that you put up against me easily. When can I come home and be treated like a man instead of a, a commodity or an animal? Let me say it like this. If you think Jackie Robinson was great, Muhammad Ali was Jackie Robinson on a turbocharger. Yeah. Well, and the only athlete of, of all athletes known worldwide, not just in the U.S., but he, anywhere he went, people knew who he was. Let me give you a couple of thoughts on that. Um, Muhammad Ali's acts of kindness are known all over the world. There was a reporter from the Washington Post who was captured and taken captive in Iran. And Iran is basically a Muslim country. Ali believed the man to be innocent. So he told, he, he, he released a statement that said, I believe this man is innocent and he should be released. People in Iran heard about that and pressure eventually mounted and they released the man. Okay, he was traveling through India and he was giving some lectures and things and he locked eyes on a young man that was sitting in the crowd about 18, 19 years old and Ali took a liking to him immediately and he walked up to him after the lecture and he said, would you like to go to school in America? Would you like to go to college in America? And the kid sat there. He didn't know what to do. Ali pulled out a checkbook and he wrote him a check for $35,000 and said, you think this will take care of the first year? And he was subject to do acts of kindness like that everywhere. Uh, I'll give you another one that I thought was maybe one of the greatest things that he ever did. I lived in Los Angeles uh, for about a year and a half. And in Los Angeles, there was a man, 21-year-old young man, and he was up on the ninth floor of a building and he was going to jump off and commit suicide. And Ali was watching television and he saw the coverage. He shut the television off. He jumped in his Rolls Royce. He drove, and to get there in time, he drove on the wrong side of the road when he had to. And he kept flashing his lights, making people think that he was an undercover policeman or something. And when he got there, the crowd started chanting, Ali, Ali. He ignored all of that. And because of his fame, they let him up to the ninth floor, and he talked that man down. Amazing. And when he finished, got done talking him down, the man kept saying, I'm going to jump to my death because I'm a nobody. He said, no, no, no. He said, first of all, you're my brother, number one. And number two, I love you. And he talked him down. And then he went to the police station with him. And then he went to the hospital with him. Then he encouraged people to get this man a job and get him some nice clothes. And he even told the man, he said, if you want to, after you come down, he said, I'll walk the streets with you through Los Angeles and prove to people you are somebody. Amazing. You never hear those stories. Exactly. No, no, you don't. No, you don't. Now, no. that's the problem. See, now, let me show you this. So, if you're going to get on the man's case for having a braggadocio, okay, then you got to tell the whole story. And if you're going to profile somebody, pro means that you're for something, and file means the whole thing. So tell the whole story. See what I mean? Yeah. I'll tell you one more story that, 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 that really touched me, made him a true champion to me. Uh, if you remember back in the 70s, they said that the state of New York was going broke. And they said there was a Jewish rest home in the state of New York, that if they didn't get a million dollars for their operating budget, would have to close their doors. And they said that the rest of the New York hospitals were full and couldn't take these people. And, and, and Ali was sitting at his home in Louisville, Kentucky, and read this in the newspaper. Got on a plane the same day 
found the Jewish rest home, walked in, wrote a check for a million dollars, put it down on the counter, said, here. And here is a Muslim writing a check for a million dollars for a Jewish rest home. Now, here's the question to America. He said, if you're not willing to match him deed for deed, you're in no place to critique him. He said, pull out your checkbook, write a million dollar check for some Muslims, and then you can talk on his level. Oh, you're not willing to do that? Can't critique him. So then did you get to spend a day with him? Yes. What was um, that like? Well, let me say it like this. If you believe in destiny, if you believe in fate, if you a hunger and thirst for something that's right and good, that's what was happening to me as a young man. And I believed then, as I do now, that there was another realm that existed. And I'll come back and talk about that a little later. But Ali had all the qualities of someone from that realm. And I said, during my lifetime, I have to meet this man. So I, I'd followed his career ever since I was 12 years old. I picked up a newspaper and it said he would be training for his next fight. And it said, at his training camp in Deer Lake, Pennsylvania. I went and I got a map and I looked up Deer Lake, Pennsylvania. So it's a little bitty spot. He said, yeah, if I go to Deer Lake, I know everybody there. Got to know where his training camp is. <laughs> so with no other information than that, I jumped in a car that really shouldn't have been driven across town. It was a piece of junk. I drove through four states and I got to uh, Pennsylvania. And I got to Deer Lake, Pennsylvania. And I said to myself, I bet you a gas station attendant knows where it's training. I walked, uh, drove into the first gas station and said, where's Ali's training camp? He said, oh, it's the third uh, driveway up here, uh, up this mountain. And he said, and it's not marked. And I drove straight into his training camp. And here's what impressed me. There were no bars. There were no gates. There were no locks, there were no dogs, and there were no security guards. And he let me drive straight onto his private property. And I, not, I'm talking about timing. I no sooner got out of my car than he had. He has a mosque on his campus. He came out of his mosque where he'd been praying, and he sat down on the steps, and he was tying on his shoes to go do his road work. And at that time, he advertised Brute Aftershave. So I had gotten him some Brute products as a little gift. And he said, oh, that's very kind of you. He said, I, and I told him, I said, I can run four miles. I'll run with you if you want to. He said, no, my training is secret. He said, you can't come. He said, but go, to the, go on into the camp and, and go to the, the kitchen and get yourself something to eat. And I'll be back in about an hour and a half when I finish my road work. And he let me spend overnight at his training camp. He'd never seen me, but never seen me before. And he said this. The, he said, uh, watch this. There was no locks on any door except his bedroom door. You could go any place on his entire training camp without permission, without asking anybody for permission. And then here's the thing that, that made my respect for him just go off the scale. When it came time for him to spar, I'm going to talk about his character, I'm going to talk about his skills first, in a second. But when it came time for him to spar, a young white male came in and kept interrupting him. And he was trying to spar, and then this guy would say something and interrupt. And he kept saying, if you don't convert to Christianity, you're going to lose your next fight. And so finally, Ali, and so he kept doing that. Ali's bodyguards started creeping around the sides of the auditorium like they were going to grab this guy. And Ali said, no, 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 don't grab him, don't grab him. He said this. He stopped his sparring session. He said, listen, young man, he said, you've interrupted me about three times now. He said, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the floor. You have five minutes. Say anything you want to say. And he said what he had to say. And Ali said, now, are you through? He said, yeah. He said, now, let me ask you a couple of questions. He said, you ever been hit by Joe Frazier? Oh, you haven't. He said, you ever made a million dollars in 15 minutes? He said, I have. He said, listen, you're well intended, but there's a lot of things that you don't know. And Ali did not embarrass him. He did not put him down. He said, now, let me, let me give you one more scenario. He said, I am the most recognizable athletic face on the planet. And I let you come to my training camp, which is my private property. He said, did anybody frisk you? He said, no. Did anybody even ask you for ID? He said, no. He said, you could have walked in here with a pistol and blown my head off. 
He said, but I fear no man because I haven't done anybody wrong. He said, and I let you come into my training camp, and then I gave you the floor in my training camp for five minutes to say anything you want to say. Could you do that with Jimmy Carter? Could you do that with Taylor, who was a big movie actor at that yeah. time? He said, no. He said, I'm the most recognized uh, athletic face on, on, the, on the planet. I'll let you do that. My respect for him just exploded. Now, I want to tell you one other thing about his physical skills. Uh, a genius is somebody who can shoot at a target nobody else can even see and hit it. So his physical skills put him in a place to use that genius. He had incredible footwork. And many times people don't realize how important box, uh, footwork is in boxing. Because when you get into a heated exchange, if you can't escape, you get hit with two hard blows and you get weary and you start stumbling and if you can't escape you get hit with that third fourth and fifth blow and you're down and out most of the people who ever clocked Ali with a good punch couldn't hit him a second time that hard during the rest of the entire fight so Ali could backpedal faster than most people could come forward yeah you know what I'm saying then the thing they tell you to do in, in boxing never do this they said never go straight back with your chin up in the air you hear Teddy Atlas, he'll tell you that all the time. Never go straight back with your chin up in the air. If you're going to go back, go backwards at angles like this. So Ali would go backwards at angles, you know, and the thing is the guy would lunge after him. And what happens is when you lunge, you lean forward. And when you lean forward, you also stick your head out and then Ali clocks you. He gets you to chase him. And you leaning forward, throwing punches and missing with your chin sticking out. And then he whacks you and he could hit, he could hit people harder but going backwards than most of them could come coming forward. And if you don't believe me, go and look at the film of the second fight with Sonny Liston. And Ali hit Liston with a punch that knocked him out while Ali was backpedaling when he hit him. So he had a skill set that was just unmatched. And as long as Ali came in in great shape, he was almost unbeatable. The other thing when I was in his training camp is his hands moved so fast all the other guys who were hitting the heavy bag when, when it hit the bag it would make this heavy thud. Boom, boom, boom. And when Ali would throw a punch, his hands moved so fast until they created an air vacuum. You go, sup, sup, and the, the bag would just crackle it would echo throughout the, throughout the gym. You know what I'm saying? And I said, oh, man, it's the difference between hit with a basketball boom, and a baseball going 95 miles an hour. And that's why when he hit, when he punched people, he, the most of them got cut so bad. Because, you, you know, it's, it isn't power, it's speed. And he knew that speed was power. Well, that was the thing. He was a heavyweight with uh, the speed of uh, a middleweight. Yeah. Something, you know. He was... <clears throat> Excuse me. He he was just a, a phenomenal and his his size, power, and speed all in one. It was he was just an amazing athlete. Yes, and one of the other things that he found out was this: when he was supposed to fight George Foreman in Zaire, Africa, he said, "I fought Sonny Liston, and Sonny Liston was big and strong and mean and could really hit." He said, "But George Foreman is bigger and stronger and meaner than Sonny Liston." He said, so I can't afford to go down. So he said, he, something that he learned from Sugar Ray Robinson, he said, there are tiny muscles on the sides of your feet that help govern your balance. And he said, but because if you do your jogging, your foot hits the ground so fast and comes back up, you don't exercise those muscles. He said, those muscles can only be exercised by walking. You have, your foot has to hit the ground slower and then govern, you, govern your equilibrium as your foot stays on the ground. So you have to walk slower in order to do that. So after he would finish his normal training, he would go out and walk two or three miles every night in his training to fight George Foreman. And he, 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 he knew all kinds of little secrets like that. I'm going to tell you something else about him. He has huge eyes. And his eyes are not dark brown. Most African-American people have dark brown eyes just like mine. But his eyes are kind of a hazel green. And he can go extremely long periods without blinking. And what will happen is this, is if you look at a snake, a snake almost hypnotizes its prey. 
And the reason why is because uh, I saw a snake do this to a, uh, to a chipmunk. The snake was in between the tree and the water. And the, and the snake crawled up and then he got in position and he froze. And the chipmunk saw him, but he came down the tree anyhow. But because the, the snake froze, his camouflage was so perfect that the, 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 the chipmunk said, oh, there couldn't be anything living there. There's nothing moving. And the snake raised up like this, and the chipmunk saw his eyes. And I said, surely the chipmunk will run. But what happens is he locks eyes on you. And then once the, the chipmunk kept looking him in the eyes, and, and, and if you look him in the eyes like this, the snake's body was moving toward him like this, and he couldn't see his body moving, because all he could see was his eyes. <laughs> Until he standing right there, and the snake chomped him. That's what Ali does, and he starts with the stare down. He looks you dead in the eyes without blinking. Then he, he'll fasten his eyes on you like this for a long time. Boom! And you never see his hands coming. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So, I mean, he had a lot, lots of techniques. The other thing he had going for him is this. Here's what won a lot of the judges over. Ali had this super cognizance. He knew where he was at at all times in every situation. And when he was in the second fight with Joe Frazier, and everybody said, oh, Frazier would knock him out in five rounds. And he knocked him down in the first fight. He knocked him out in the second fight. And they were in about the third round. And... Frazier lunged at Ali and missed him. And Ali popped him with two jabs in the right hand, grabbed Joe and pulled him in and tied him up, leaned his back up against the ropes, and he knew exactly he was in front of the judging table, winked over at the judges and winked. He said, who do you think's winning this fight? <laughs> I'll tell you something else that he was good at. He was good at playing things off. He was somewhat the magician, but he was also the survivor. Um... He was fighting Henry Cooper in London, and the first five rounds, he was beating Cooper easily, but he was toying with him. He wouldn't go ahead and get him out of it. He was just embarrassing the man. He could hit Cooper with a jab anytime he wanted to, but Ali has always been susceptible to a left hook, and the reason why is because Ali carries his right hand too low. And you got to have your right hand up in order to block a left hook. And sometimes you will hear a trainer, if he thinks his man is going to get hit with a left hook, he'll say, answer the phone. So if you hold your, hand, your, right, you know, if you hold your right hand up like that, that's to block that left hook. So Ali was, he was, came out in the next round. He was kind of whipping on Cooper and dancing around and showing off. And Cooper uncorked this wicked left hook. And he hit Ali so hard until he knocked him backwards. And he fell and he slid across the ring until his head was hanging out from under the bo bottom rope. And he knocked him loony. And, and, and he, basically, Ali was saved by the bell. He was right at the end of the round. And they asked him about it later, and they said, How, what did you feel when, when Cooper hit you with that? He said, oh, Liz Taylor was sitting in the front row. I did that just so I could look up her skirt. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, you didn't. <laughs> Cooper knocked you silly. <laughs> well, thanks for coming in and sharing all those stories. We, we really appreciate it, and I uh, can't wait to share them with the rest of the world. Yes, and I will tell you this. What Ali also did for me was this, is... He said, I'm going to stir racism down. It's got to stop. He said, but I'm a larger human being than that. He always used his fame for good. And he never stopped doing acts of kindness. And he said, one of his final statements, which I thought was one of the greatest statements he could ever make. Finally, after he had won the American public over, and of course, when he lit, lit the Olympic torch, I mean, people burst into tears, and I was one of them. I was sitting in my living room with my son, and he said, look, Dad, it's Muhammad Ali. And by this time, he was shaking with the Parkinson's disease. And he lit the torch. And I told my son, I said, I want you to wait here for just a minute. I went out to the garage, and I dig through my papers, and I found a fan letter that Ali had written back to me. And I showed that to my son. And my son's respect for me went up from that point.
you know so he was always doing good the greatest statement I think he made is this he said I wish everyone would love each other as much as they love me 